Today, we're going to talk about how we represent words in continuous space. And we alluded to before that it's often useful to have what are called embeddings for words. And embeddings are just a fancy way of talking about representing words in a continuous space. We can also connect this to deep learning. So before we saw that in deep learning, there is a lot of power in these hidden layers of the deep networks. And the great thing about this is that these are learned representations. So can we have something similar for words? And if we had something like this, that could give us a lot of power. So for example, it could encode information like how similar is pasta to pizza. And the alternative that people used in the past was to use fragile knowledge bases like WordNet that require a lot of effort to build up over the years and may not be right for every particular application. Or, as an alternative, you just use the identity of the word itself. And there's no way a computer could know that pasta is similar to pizza, that they appear in similar contexts. Of course, this isn't a new idea. This has been around for a while. Uh, even from the 50s, there is a popular axiom that you shall know a word by the company that it keeps. In other words, you know what a word means based on the words that appear around it. So, for example, let's take a look at this example from Baroni. Marco saw a furry little wampamuck hiding in the tree. So wampamuck is a made-up word. You have no idea what it means, but you can probably guess what it means. That it's probably something like a chipmunk, or, or maybe this is an Italian speaker who confused uh, the word chipmunk with walrus or something like that and, and just made this word up, and you can guess what they mean. And you can do this because of the words around it. So there's furry, little, and hiding in the tree. So hiding in the tree tells you its size, as does the word little. Furry tells you something about it. What other words might be prefaced by furry little and might also hide in a tree? So you might think of squirrels, chipmunks. You might think of birds. They're not furry, but they're little and hide in a tree, so maybe a little bit less similar. So now you have a sense of the kinds of words that might go into that slot. This sort of intuition lends itself to a continuous representation. And if you can put words that appear in similar contexts, like music words together, or food words together, then that gives you some notion of similarity. And then, given any particular context, you can see what words are near that context in the space, and you could fill in furry little blank hiding in the tree with squirrel, chipmunk, etc. And this is not just useful as an input to your deep learning systems. Uh, this also gives you a convenient representation across languages or across modalities. You can put different kinds of things in the same space. So let's say that you have images and you want to put images in the same space. And so you could put words like wampamunk and chipmunk and squirrel close together in the same space, but you might also put similar pictures in that space. Uh, so pictures of squirrels or chipmunks or unidentified brown creatures that could indeed be a wampamunk. And you can put that in the same space. This is also useful across languages. So let's say that you want to build a system that works for both English and Spanish. If you put both English words and Spanish words into the same space, this gives you a way of encoding that information without having a hard matching, say, with the dictionary. So now that we've introduced the intuition behind these embedding spaces, we'll talk about one very specific kind of embedding that has become useful and ubiquitous in the natural language processing community.